Pirates are famous for drinking rum. Their favorite drink was to mix rum, sugar and lime juice into punch and serve it in a bowl. The scene with the punch bowl was almost ritualistic and wherever there was a punch bowl, there were pipes and tobacco. Pirates love to smoke as much as they love drinking rum. In the Americas, tobacco was cheap and plentiful. Some believed it had medicinal properties. It would often be served in barber shops as a cure for toothaches. However, many recognized it as harmful. The church was especially critical and recognized it as addictive, noxious and unhealthy, both to the smoker and those nearby, especially children. No one really cared about the health risks. 17th century life was dangerous already and often quite boring, so a stimulating and soothing substance was a cheap and much welcome addition to the daily life. Sea captains often acquired tobacco as a morale boost for the crew. It was certainly safer than letting them drink large quantities of alcohol. If food was unavailable, pirates were known to smoke tobacco as a substitute. Indeed, they should hardly be considered paragons of good health. Sure, they were quite physically active and ate better food than the average sailor, but they were also heavily sunburned, drank voraciously and smoked like chimneys. They smoked in taverns, camps and aboard their ships. The tween decks of a ship always smelled like tobacco. Sometimes it was used as a form of perfume, burned in large quantities to clear out the festering stench of sweaty men, animals and rotting wood, which would gather below deck in the tropics. But smoking below deck was a fire hazard. Anyone doing so had to put a cap on their pipe. Stray embers could easily set the ship ablaze, and a flame in the magazine could blow them all to kingdom come. Aboard a merchant or man of war, the crew were only allowed to smoke in the forecastle, which is also where they slept. Pirates preferred to smoke on the open deck. It was common to sit in large groups around a bowl of punch. Tubs of water were set out, in which they extinguished their pipes when they were finished. They usually had a slave or cabin boy for filling the pipes with tobacco and lighting them. The Dutch, French and English prefer to smoke from pipes. The best kind of pipe were made from white clay and imported from Europe. In the wreck of the privateer ship Dauphine, they found white clay pipes marked with the initials T.O. Possibly Thomas Owen, a master pipe maker active in Bristol between 1698 and 1725. Maybe these pipes had been purchased or stolen from an English ship. For the sake of shipboard convenience, these pipes had been cut down, but most white clays had very long stems. This allowed the smoke to cool before reaching your mouth. It also made them more fragile, which wasn't always a bad thing. Pipes made from red clay were often produced locally and associated with the lower classes. They were cheaper, had shorter stems and were considered inferior. Wooden pipes were seen as the worst, along with weird improvised ones. The islanders of St. Lago were documented as smoking from coconut pipes, and one group of pirates were described as using crab claws. A pipe could be kept anywhere on the pirate's person. One might stick it into his hat. Aboard the Dauphine, they found pipes kept in wooden holders. Both were shaped like pistols, but one was considerably more detailed. Tobacco could be kept on your person in a special tobacco pouch. In this pouch, you'd also have a little pick for picking clean the pipe bowl. Dampier described how some pirates would harvest the teeth from large spiders to be used for this purpose. The spider's fang could also be used as toothpicks and were especially good if you had a toothache. Some pirates claimed that it could dampen the pain. When pirates arrived in port to spend their ill-gotten gains, they'd be welcomed by even more smokers. Sailors, laborers, governors, even slaves. Women in the Caribbean were described as cursing drinking and smoking as much as their men. In the late 17th century, a woman's smoking was uh, seen as a sign of promiscuity, and this image has survived into our day and age. These ladies of uh, questionable morals were more than glad to have a pirate light their pipe and invite them to one of the shady establishments. Upon entering one of these taverns, you'd be met by a stinking mist. It clouded rafters and smudged the walls. Ned Ward, who I previously quoted in the introduction, described what a typical conversation between two tavern smokers sounded like. 
there was no talking amongst them, but puff was the period of every sentence, and what they said was as short as possible for fear of losing the pleasure of a whiff. As, how do you do? Puff. Thank you. Puff. Is the weed good? Puff. Excellent. Puff. It's fine weather. Puff. God be thanked. Puff. What's a clock? Puff. Etc. Puff. <laughs> Tobacco was cheap and plentiful, so much so that it was even smoked in prison. Pirates unfortunate enough to enter Newgate in London would be met by a familiar stink of unwashed bodies and the ubiquitous fog of tobacco smoke in the poorly ventilated surroundings. Prisoners could have tobacco brought in by their friends or buy it at the little bar kept by the jailer. Here the drinks were sold at rip-off prices and female prisoners flirted with the men trying to earn a pregnancy so they could plead the belly, much like Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed did. A pirate was more likely to be marooned by his own comrades, but even on a desert island he might not have to live without a smoke. The real life inspiration behind Robinson Crusoe was a privateer named Alexander Selkirk, self marooned on an island in the American Pacific. His belongings included a pipe and tobacco. We find similar incidents of pirates splitting away from their companies or even getting marooned at sea. They're given tobacco, sometimes chocolate, almost as if it was a cruelty to deprive them of some basic form of pleasure. And if you happen to smoke it all up, no biggie. One group of marooned buccaneers were described as finding a fragrant sort of herb, which they called wild sage. They picked the leaves and smoked them, but in lack of actual pipes, they used crab claws. Hopefully, the pirate would neither be imprisoned nor marooned, but risking both by stealing tobacco was uh, certainly worth it to them. Plundering tobacco was their most common mode of acquisition. It was rare for pirates to actually sell the tobacco they plundered. Most of their stolen goods were kept in the hold until the pirates decided to call quits and split the goods between them. Each man would then be responsible for selling his own share of produce. Tobacco on the other hand was divided among the crew as soon as it was looted because it was used for personal consumption. Tobacco could be found across the colonies. In fact, much like the sugar industry, piracy can largely be credited for kickstarting at least the English tobacco industry. In the 1610s, Pirates kidnapped African and Indian slaves from Spanish colonies and brought them to the newly settled island of Bermuda. The slaves were not only necessary for manual labor, but also for teaching the settlers how to cultivate tobacco, which they in turn had learned from Spanish plantations. Bermuda would go on to use slavery for specific purposes like these. Many of their slaves would be craftsmen, shipbuilders and sailors, but I digress. It's a perfect example of how piracy was interconnected with the slave and tobacco trade. Many pirates would become tobacco planters themselves, especially on the island of Tortuga. Tortuga tobacco was best for chewing, but the best funk came from Spanish colonies, especially modern day Venezuela. Gibraltar tobacco was called tabaco de sacerdotes, priest's tobacco, but the best came apparently from the town of Verina. In the north, Virginia produced both sweet and strong tobacco great for smoking. However, Virginia wasn't a dependable hub for pirates. Pirates preferred urban, maritime communities, where they could easily blend in with the local sailors and easily fence their ill-gotten gains. Additionally, tobacco served as the local currency in Virginia, so if a pirate arrived with gold and silver, he'd have a hard time buying anything and would raise a lot of suspicion. Whilst the Northern Europeans preferred to smoke from their pipes, there were other modes of consumption. The oldest method was simply to chew the leaves. Chewing tobacco was also woven into plates. Tobacco was also processed into snuff, tobacco powder inhaled through the nose. Snuff was popular in Europe, not so much in the Caribbean, but it happened. Snuff was prepared manually. This was done using a grater. It consisted of a container topped by a metal grater. You'd then take plug tobacco and rubbed it against the grate. The snuff would collect in the container, allowing you to remove the grate and harvest the snuff. Aboard the Dauphine they found a tobacco grater in the shape of a boat. It had been carved from a barrel stave, likely by one of the crewmen. Wood carving was a popular method in which sailors spent their time. The Spanish preferred to smoke cigars. They were enjoyed by both men and women, aristocrats, sailors and slaves. By white Spaniards, blacks and Indians. 
Pirates were surely able to steal cigars from Spanish ships, so it's not unfeasible that we find one or two smoke in them, much like Charles Vane in Black Sails. Though a pirate was just as likely to rip the cigar apart and put the baca in his pipe. Native Americans had been smoking cigars since... long. According to Arawak legend, a legendary traveler called Caracaracol, the scaly one, was credited with bringing them the holy herb. It was used for trade, religious ceremonies, and pleasure. The Kuna of Darien were frequent allies of pirates. They would give them provisions like food and tobacco in return for their assistance against the Spanish. A buccaneer surgeon named Lionel Wafer spent several years living among them and described how they smoked tobacco. It was a communal activity with a group of any size sitting together in a large room. A little boy would light a big cigar and go from person to person, blowing tobacco smoke in their face. The smoke was inhaled and kept as long as possible without exhaling or inhaling. Other Indians smoked cigars on their own, much like anyone else. The Carib Indians used tobacco to tame parrots, many of whom were sold to sailors and pirates. After capturing the parrot they fed it by hand, and if it ever bit them, they blew tobacco on its beak to punish and pacify it. Cigarettes would not become popular until 1855. The Arawaks were also documented as producing a narcotic snuff. This was primarily used for religious ceremonies, and I don't think pirates ever got to try it. I often get questions if pirates ever used any hardy drugs, and well, the answer is alcohol. It was cheap, effective, and readily available. Other substances were rare and hard to find. Cocaine wasn't refined until 1855, but pirates frequently encountered a coca leaf during their adventures in the Spanish Pacific. It was described as tasting like bay leaves, and that it turned your teeth green. The Spanish in South America would ration it out to their Indian subjects as a form of payment, and it was also given to their soldiers. They would stick it in their cheeks during combat, keeping their energy high and hunger at bay. A few buccaneers visited Southeast Asia. They were often treated to the betel nut, a mild stimulant producing a warming sensation in the body. William Dampier described the nut as tasting rough, dyeing your lips red and your teeth black, but that it cleansed your gums and was, quote, wholesome for the stomach, unquote. Modern research has found that the betel nut causes cancer and should be avoided. The question on everyone's mind is, did pirates smoke weed? In the period, weed was a slang for tobacco. Concerning marijuana, it doesn't seem to have been produced outside of Asia. William Dampier was actually one of the first Englishmen to ever describe the effects of marijuana when he visited Indonesia in 1689. I'll read the entire segment from his book. They have here a sort of herb or plant called ganga, or bang. I never saw any but once, and that was at some distance from me. It appeared to me like hemp, and I thought it had been hemp, till I was told to the contrary. It was reported of this plant that if it is infused with any liquor, it will stupefy the brains of any person that drinks thereof. But it operates diversely, according to the constitution of the person. Some it keeps sleepy, some merry, putting them into a laughing fit, and others it makes mad. But after two or three hours, they come to themselves again. I never saw the effects of it on any person, but I have heard much discourse of it. What other use of this plant may serve for, I know not, but I know it is much esteemed here and in other places too, whither it is transported. So, Dampier did not smoke marijuana. In the 1670s, East India merchant Robert Knox ate cannabis to ward off the nauseating effects of bad shipboard water. Knox wrote of the herb that it intoxicates the brain and makes one jiddy. When he returned to London, he showed a sample of cannabis to Robert Hooke, a soon-to-be physician. Hooke described it as an intoxicating leaf and seed, Wholesome, though for a time it takes away the memory and understanding. The next month, he delivered a lecture to the Royal Society, describing his experiments on the drug. He said it was administered by grinding the leaves and seeds into a fine powder, enough to fill a common tobacco pipe, but it was not smoked, it was chewed and swallowed. Who went on to advocate its medicinal usage, and even wanted to grow cannabis in London? However, his ambitions had lackluster results. Cannabis seeds could still be administered in apothecaries as a cure for coughs, asthma, jaundice, and similar diseases. Marijuana appears to have been more popular in 17th century Amsterdam, where it was actually smoked. 
here's a period painting of Dutch potheads. I'm not exactly well versed in the Golden Age Dutch 420 community, but the YouTube channel Alemansens made a video about it, so I'd suggest you give him a look. Opium was a popular trade product in India and Southeast Asia. Pirates operating in the region often plundered it. However, I haven't found any cases of them actively using it. It was widely consumed in India and Malaysia, and could be sold to smugglers at a considerable profit. Opium consumption was even prohibited in a few Asian colonies. Dampier wrote how his crew had to be very careful about selling theirs. Their customer was a Dutchman living in Malacca, indicating that at least some Europeans were addicted to it. Opium consumption was also popular with the employees of the East India companies. Their assignments were far from enjoyable. They had often been sent to Asia by force, but that's for another video. It was rare to find opium outside of Asia. It was commonly found in a doctor's medicine chest, in liquid form and known as laudanum. It was used to relieve pain, as an anesthesia, or even as a sort of sleeping pill, or when mosquitoes were especially bad. Even though alternative drugs existed, they were incredibly rare, and ultimately overshadowed by alcohol and tobacco. Foreign people saw liquor and smoke as intrinsical to European culture. A group of Dutchmen in West Africa were ambushed by a native chief. He lined a walkway to his palace with their skulls, but eventually got a bad conscience. So he buried them in a chest, together with some items they'd appreciate in the afterlife. Brandy, pipes, and tobacco. As usual, thank you to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Patreon supporters get early access to my videos and can watch them without ads. And if you want to interact with fellow pirate enthusiasts, check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Cheerio!